Uh, no, everybody's here. I have some kids absent today, so. Okay, no worries. So thank you for your time this morning. Um, it for for those of you who do not know me, some of you may. I my name is Tiffany Kitap, and I am a banker here in the Fayette and Westmoreland County area. I live in Uniontown. Um, I'm a Fayette County native, and I am a banker. And I use that term loosely because there are many different types of bankers. We're going to talk about the different types today and what it is to get into banking. Um, do we have anyone in the room that had thought that they might want to be a banker? I or that might be an area of interest? Yeah, there's one. I do want to talk about that. And there, and there might be more when I talk to you about the different types of banking that there are. So I am now a specialized banker. I run our um, investment and wealth management division here at the bank. Um, I currently work for Scottsdale Bank and Trust and I run MidPen Financial Services. But I want to talk a little bit about where, where I came from and my background and my education. Um, so I guess starting with my education, I went, I graduated from Newton High School and I went to Cal U. I do have several degrees. There isn't one specific degree that will get you into banking, but there are different degrees that will help you in different parts of banking. I actually went to law school. Um, I graduated from law school. I have a marketing degree and I have a bachelor's in business administration and economics as well. So I have um, a unique educational background that meets my needs here in the investment world. But I started as a teller. I've been in the banking industry for 17 years. And I started as a teller when I was in college. Uh, I worked for PNC Bank and I worked for, um, actually I was bought and sold through the National City PNC <laughs> for key. Um, banking was like the wild, wild west in the, in the early 2000s. But here today I am in the um, wealth world. So when we think of banking, what you guys primarily probably think of for banking is the brick and mortar bank that you walk into, which is, I'm sorry, go ahead. What? No, go oh, ahead. I, oh, I, I, so, I'm sorry. I thought I heard somebody say something. Um, so yes, the brick and mortar banking, that's called retail banking. And in retail banking, we have our tellers, we have our loan professionals, we have our managers. They do what you need them to do for like you personally when you do your banking. So that would be your deposits, your withdrawals, your loans, if you need a credit card. Those are the retail bank that you can walk in and a bank that you would of when it is retail banking. Now, I will tell you that retail banking is the number one front line of defense for banking. And I'll pause there because it's the most important. Um, all illegal activity that takes place in the United States can be money laundered through banks. So that's proceeds from drug trafficking, human trafficking, organized crime, um, tax evasion. So all of these things, all of the these sources of illicit and illegal funds can pass mm -hmm. through the bank system. So we talk about retail banking being our fraud busters, our number one line of defense. We are so regulated in the banking world that we have very specific protocols on what to do and how to do it. But the tellers are the number one most important role in the bank because they're gonna see the transactions coming in. So whereas a lot of people think that bankers are simple, uh, starting out to be you know, taking a deposit or making a loan payment or making a withdrawal, um, they're also fraud busters. And we, they're heavily trained to detect all kinds of different things. Retail banking, um, our brick and mortar branches are also your community partners. Banking in, in Mr. Nettle, um, I had provided him with a couple of, I'm going to pull them up and reference them, but I had provided a loose definition of what is banking and it heavily involves being great community partners. So there is a, a, 
a series that I shared today. It's from Penn State University, and it is their Money Counts curriculum. It is complimentary and public to all of you. The links will be shared if they have not yet for anyone who is interested. But banking, the definition is defined as business activity of accepting and safeguarding money owned by other individuals and entities and lending out this money in order to conduct economic activities such as making profit or civilly covering operating expenses. So banks are always out and about in the community because we play a major role in economic development, making loans, growing business, making mortgages, growing tax base. So retail banking, as you know it, the bank that you can walk in and out of is the most, um, most common to your needs today. But you have to think of banking as spokes on a wheel. That is just one part of banking. There are specialized areas that spurt off of the retail bank. You can walk in and you can talk to, um, you can talk with somebody about their investments. You can walk in and want to start a business and need a loan. You can walk in and need a mortgage. You can say, I'm a business owner and I need to accept debit cards or I'm a business owner and I need to make payroll services, or I want to buy a stock portfolio. There are about eight different spokes that go off of the retail banking wheel and each one of those do a specific thing. Most people do start in the retail banking sector and growing from a teller up. You need all of the education to be a banker that you would learn it starting in a teller role. It is actually very difficult to not start in the retail bank um, and work to a specialized position. And when I talk about this wheel, I'm probably the perfect example of going around the wheel in the banking arena. So I started as a teller and then I became a banker. So I opened new accounts and did loans. And then I became a manager. So I did all that. Plus I managed the bank's goals. And then I added on investments. So I did everything that I did before um, and was able to offer investments. I do have licenses. Um, the licenses you do have to, they are federal government licenses and licenses through the state of Pennsylvania. So if you ever wanted to go to the investment world, um, you do need specific licenses. So I took on those licenses and took on law school and I, I was able to build my skill set up through wealth management. So I've done commercial lending. I've offered the I've offered mortgages. I've done small business loans. I've, I've been able to offer debit card solutions or credit card solutions, helping people build their credit, establishing credit. Um, all the way through where I am today. So to talk a little bit about today about what I specifically do, because maybe you don't want to be a banker, but maybe you have aspirations of going into the finance world or the wealth management or private banking or investment world. Um, that's specifically what I do now. And I have a I wear a couple of different hats. So you can come to me and say, I'm retiring. I need to know what to do with my 401k or I'm planning to retire and I need to know how much money that I need to retire. Or um, my mom is elderly and we don't wanna pay inheritance taxes if something happened to her. How do we get around inheritance taxes? Or I need life insurance. Or I'm a business owner and I need to offer my employees a 401k plan. So I've worked through all of those folks to a very specialized um, area now. I'll stop there before diving into any of these specifically. We've talked about retail banking, community partnership. We've talked about business banking, commercial banking, uh, cash management and credit card processing. What specifically would would be most beneficial for me to touch upon with you today okay so i have a question for you and then uh, yeah talk about that 
So why is it when I go into my bank, every time they ask me who I am, but when my wife walks in, they know who she is? Well, Mur Muriel's a unicorn. <laughs> but going back to that whole fraud defense, yes. I can tell you it's going to be an, a topic that you guys are going to find really beneficial. There is more fraud in the world right now than ever before. And we've seen a significant uptick um, since COVID because rules and regulations, really stringent rules and regulations that were put in place, we had to learn to do things differently. Okay. So maybe we don't see Mr. Nettle for a little while. He's not coming into the bank all of the time. And he found that virtual banking was very convenient and mobile banking was very convenient. And we had to learn how to service him if he didn't want to come into the bank. Well, that also opened the door for fraud, manipulation, identity theft, um, spoofing, catfishing, um, romance scandals, like all kinds of things that we've never seen before. So when Mr. Nuttle comes into the bank, we need to make sure that it is Mr. Nuttle. You know, maybe we've seen him with his mask for a year and a half now, and now he's coming in without a mask, or maybe he didn't have his mask on fully vaccinated and he put it back on. Um, but we can never be sure that Mr. Nettle is Mr. Nettle. And even if it is Mr. Nettle, or do we need to protect him from himself? Is he met somebody online or is he, does he think one of his children are in duress and need money? Um, has he received an email that says he's received an inheritance and he needs to wire money to pay the legal fees? Um, some really popular ones right now are the romance scams. People that if you like Facebook or TikTok, like any a, a, like a widowed or single status, yes. there are people that prey upon elderly women or elderly men who are recent widows, and, you, and if you've tagged yourself as a widow, you're very easy prey. Um, there's some things in TikTok right now um, that there's some built-in links that if you buy a TikTok product, your information's being sold um, on different channels. Catfishing is really big. Um, and just the normal getting a check in the mail. So okay. when we say... Know, do we need to protect Mr. Nuttle from himself? If he gets a check in the mail, maybe he doesn't realize that someone, the check might not be good. Somebody might not be trying to give him money. So a couple of things right now that you guys might see. If you enroll in anything, I guarantee you're going to have fraud on your debit card. If you enroll in any program or um, there's a ton with the Amazon Prime or Apple Music, if you enroll in some type of program, Odds are the rules of that program are going to sell your information to something else. Example, I have an, a 17 year old cousin. She has some lifelong cell phone protector case. She enrolled in it. And then all of a sudden she's enrolled in Apple Music and there's an Amazon Prime subscription. So there's some sticky tag on services right now. So that's something we have to watch for on the electronic end. Um, the car wrap scams are out there that you could be surfing around and somebody might be DM you, DMing you or messaging you and emailing you saying, hey, I own this business. I have this product. If you can put a wrap on your car, um, we'll pay you to market us. We'll, we'll send you a check for $5,000 and that'll cover the wrap on your car and the in the fees but while we're waiting on that check we're going to give you a little bit too much you have to send some back to us to cover um anything extra we've overpaid you so what's really popular is that they send you this check for five thousand dollars the check's bad and while the check is clearing you're sending back your own money to pay for the excess and then you're out the money and they get the money Gift card scams are another. Um, 
that you can meet someone online. I have numerous examples that I could use and they could say, um, you know, I have a medical emergency or, you know, we're together. I need gas money. Can you pay me? And, um, I don't, I don't have a bank. Can you, um, and I don't use banks and I don't like, I don't even have a debit card. Can you go to giant Eagle or Gecko and buy me a gift card and then take a picture of the front and back of that gift card so that I can come and see you. That's a popular one right now. Um, just I have getting, one. Yeah, I go have ahead. One. this is interesting. And I don't know if you guys know who it is. I'm wearing their sweatshirt. Um, the monkeys, you know, the monkeys, Mickey Dolan's his manager, which I know, his email was spoofed. And what happened yep. was he had an email from this promotion manager saying that I'm in Europe right now. It's my niece's birthday. Can you run out and go get, pay for a $150 Google card and then Google Play card and then send me the information so I can give it to her? And I'm going, wait a minute. First off, I know the guy and I trust the guy, but no one in their right mind would ask me to do that. And then I reached out and said, no, my email was smooth. So, again, when things sound ridiculous, it probably is. The car wrap is a good one right now because I've been getting a lot of that. Yep. So, with what you're doing right now, so can you also be considered a financial planner? Yes. yes. So, what, and I'm just using someone's name that I know. So, do you so, and Devin do the same thing? except you're on the back again. So, yes. So I, I can, I wear many hats for the bank. I think geographically um, I came up through banking and I layer the okay. hats on, but whether you're getting a CFP and an advisor in a bank or externally, we are accredited the same way. We hold the same licenses and credentials. Um, I just have access to balances and information and money more than an outsider. Now, I will tell you, um, there is a major difference that I pride myself on, and I do share this. Um, I am a W-2 salaried employee with a compensation plan. Means um, I'm not an independent that makes my income off of generating fees and compensation. Okay. The bank gives me unbiasedly to give financial advice, regardless of the compensation that comes back to the bank. So if I offer them a retirement plan that pays me 1% a year, or I offer them a retirement plan that pays them 7% a year, I'm paid the same way. So there's no conflict of interest or, uh, or biasness that would force me to do something unethical. So for the licenses that I have, I am cloaked and bound in ethics. Um, down to hair follicle, blood testing, um, thing, ink and virtual fingerprinting, regular credit checks. Like you have to be absolutely squeaky clean. So I have not stepped into the independent world because independents only make their income based off of, sorry, um, only they make their income solely from the generation of commissions. Okay. So that's different. Okay. Now, to become a bank teller, yes. what education do you need? None. So to become a bank teller, you can, um, you, you do need a high school diploma or a GED. And we have very good lifelong tellers. With okay. the expect, and they'll, and they'll make good money. Okay, so what would be a start, starting wage for someone just out of high school that just gets hired? Mm -hmm. So it would depend on the bank. The different banks expect different things from their tellers. Some have sales and referral goals. Some okay. are just for service. So, but I can give you a range, and it actually went up last year is we became frontline of defense for COVID, and money is filthy. So I'll, I'll preface this because this is important. Money is filthy. Cash is filthy. Um, and there is no way to clean it. So prior to last year, a teller maybe could have made $10, $12 um, 
um, safe work environment. Oh, we always get like blood, drugs, things like that coming through on money. But last year with COVID, tellers, it was very, tellers were getting sick and that money was coming through. And as it's going through the money counters, you're breathing in that air, it's getting into your lungs. So the banking industry had very high COVID numbers because we could not clean our product, right? So many banks, because they are, they bankers became essential workers and there were lots of retirements. Now the average banker might make, you know, PNC Bank went national a couple of weeks ago and their tellers are starting out at $18 an hour now. Okay. Um, and they, and they, and there are, that's a more probably like sophisticated model where there is a, there's some sales expectations, great training. It's a little bit of a more robust position, but in a community bank, like maybe like Scottdale, Somerset, where we don't product push, we're more relationship focused. Um, a starting wage for a teller could be like 14, 15. Um, there are some banks that still maybe like the 10 to 14 range. But you, the average teller wage in the United States right now, starting without um, referrals or incentive or anything, is about thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Wow, that's pretty good. So especially it is, if you get the high school education. I mean, you're just absolutely out the training. Is that with benefits and health insurance, or is that just the yeah, annual yeah. wage? Most most are going to give you medical, dental, vision, okay. um, stock plan for a 1k participation tuition reimbursement so there are a lot of fringe benefits that come with being a banker and they've been very good to me and that's how i've worked up through the ranks um and once you get in as a teller you really start to understand all of those spokes on the wheel that i talked about and you know you might really like the lending part or opening new accounts or being a manager but the the education you get from being a bank teller from a fraud standpoint from how soft skills, how to talk to people, right. um, overcoming oppressions is completely invaluable. So when I retire, can I become a teller? Yes, a lot of people do. You can be a peak time, you can be a part time, you can be a full time. There are actually banking roles right now that are virtual. Okay. Like a lot of, a lot of call centers went virtual um, so if, if, you know, I, I know personally bankers that I used to sit in the office with that now sit at home and are taking care of a family member or raising children or just say, Hey, um, I can do the same thing at home. I'm going to stay at home. And, you know, if somebody ha says, I'm going to call the number on the back of my debit card, I have fraud today, right. or I need to call the number on the back of my debit card. I need to order checks. They can call someone that's actually routing to that person at home. And they're doing the same thing they did when they were sitting in the branch. Okay, I can I can see doing that in about six years. I don't know if I know any bankers that can get me in though. But anyhow, um, <laughs> so question: and, and just let you know, her husband works at PNC. When you go through that criteria to get license, background check, and everything else, does your family also get the same check? The background checks because of your job or did justin get it because of his job too no so the only thing that hinders my family is that they cannot have outside investment accounts because our monies are monitored so okay. say i was a honest financial advisor yeah. um which the way this that i work for there is a system of checks and balances that i could not squeak a penny out to embezzle it but say I was an advisor, like it's crazy. But say I wasn't honest and say that I had no oversight and I owned my own investment company and nobody was monitoring me. Um, there have been times throughout history where financial advisors would have their spouses open accounts elsewhere so that they couldn't be monitored okay. so that nobody would know what I was doing. So like, for example, I'll give you the perfect example. Um, so we cannot, we meaning like my spouse and I cannot have investment accounts, not with who I work for. All accounts have to be, all investment accounts have to be with, with Scottsdale bank or index. Um, unless they are like 401k or retirement plans that I don't have the option to hold here. So when like I had to get Justin's 401k approved because it's an external account and it can't be monitored. 
but but okay. there's a, so there's a review process. Now it would always be subject to review, and again, that's consumer protection. It doesn't have anything to do with me. It just makes sure that I'm always doing what I need to do and not dragging my family through through anything they shouldn't be in. So how many banks have you been with? Then? The 2000s were really rough. When the government bailed out the banks in 2008, they said, hey, we're going to bail you out, but you have to play by our rules. Okay. Um, that caused a lot of banks not to have the infrastructure to to stay afloat. They started to crumble. So I've actually only made one career choice for myself. Um, other than that, I was bought and sold. I started with National City. National City um, fell in 2009, bought by PNC. The Department of Justice said, PNC, you're a monopoly. You can't own all of those banks. You have to sell some off. I was sold to First Niagara. First Niagara took on bad debt. They, uh, they took on the bad loans of National City. We only survived at First Niagara for nine years because of that. those bad loans, which now there's so much regulation, you can't make a bad loan. Right. Um, and then in 2016, my job was eliminated at Key Bank. Um, so I spent several years with West Banco in North Central West Virginia. And then I came to Scottsdale three years ago. So all in all, um, six different banks. That merger and acquisition time in the banks really slowed down. Um, but we look for it to start taking place again because of what happened last year. And we'll talk about what happened last year with PPP. And I'll tell you guys what so, that is. So you're the reason why I'm still stuck at Key Bank then. Well, I told Muriel she didn't have to, to feel the need to um, to make changes. <laughs> it's just but so last hard year, to change banks, though. It is. And they make it that way. So we'll talk about that. Retail banking is sticky. Okay. So the more you have with the bank, the harder it is to leave them. So that's why it's they make everything so easy. You know, open an account with zero balance requirements. Get a debit card. It's free. Um, use online banking and online bill pay. It's so easy. It's free. It's so convenient. Get your direct deposit to come into your account. You won't have to wait in line at the branches. So all of those things make you sticky. It's hard to leave them. It's hard to walk away. Right. And the other thing is too, and I, and because I am with KeyBank, I have very few ATM machines that I can go to in Fayette County. Correct. Which frustrates the heck out of me. I had to pull money out for Sarah the other day, and I went to another bank to pull money out. It was a three fifty tran or transaction fee to do that. I'm going, that's ridiculous. The only bank, and, and not be yours, but the only bank that has a large enough database of ATM machines is PNC in the region. It's so true. And the difference between a corporate bank yeah. and a community bank, I think that's important because P Key is a, so whereas PNC is a corporate bank based on their size and the way they're regulated, they still have a huge footprint and a huge presence. Right. Key is a corporate bank that is very technology focused, so they don't have a lot of branches. They don't have a lot of banks. They want you to say, you know, I don't need a key bank close because I do everything online. I don't take out cash. I do everything online. My direct deposit goes in. So there are different types of banks based on how you like to do your banking. So like when I built that key downtown, we had First Niagara's. All, really all over the place. It was much more convenient. Yeah. There were locations more. We hadn't, we bought an ATM network. So you could go into sheets and use sheets and it'd be free. But then when he purchased first Niagara, their culture, their philosophy is different and they're more technology based. So they, they say, Hey, figure it out. If you need cash, figure it out. <laughs> That's interesting. So now you're with, um, Scottsdale. Yes. And that, how many branches does Scottsdale have? So we are tiny, but I will tell you, we, um, I specifically came here for three years for a reason. I left corporate banking and came to community banking. 
Scottsdale Bank was owned by a family. Oh, really? And many of them, it was owned by a family for over 150 years. There, the founding member of Scottsdale Bank was the wealthiest coal baron in the United States at one point. Um, Scottsdale was the richest zip code in the United States at one point. So Lawrence Keister, who was the founder of Scottsdale Bank, owned Keisterville. Okay. And that was one of the coal towns he owned, but that's where he came from. So the Keisterville, Grindstone, Republic, a lot of like the coal patches he owned. So through family history, um, they, their children took over the bank, their children took over the bank, their children took over the bank. Uh, Travis D. T- stuck, struck um, the Scottsdale Bank family several years ago. The owner's son, who was supposed to take over the bank, was killed in a drunk driving accident. By what well, he was sober, he was killed by a drunk driver, and they had no one to continue the bank. So they, we have, we are located in Fayette in Westmoreland County. I had five banks. We now have four. We closed one to be able to expand. We do plan on building more in the Uniontown Greensburg markets, um, but we're owned by Mid Penn Bank now. Okay. So even though this territory here, which is four, we have 42 branches across the state of Pennsylvania, which I do cover. So furthest, um, furthest west would be here. I'm sitting here in my Connorsville office today. And we go through State College, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, all the way to like the Delaware, Delaware Valley on the eastern side of the state. So when you do build, are you taking the Mid Penn name or are you bringing the Scottdale name? So we only got down name for these four branches because okay. there was so much history and tenure behind it. Okay. But we, we've continued to grow across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we actually probably need to look at rebranding and renaming since we're not just mid pen anymore. Cause I could but, but using that. the Scottsdale name in Union Town. That's why I was saying it. Mm-hmm. I, I think that as we continue to grow, um, uh, the, the, I think we need to reevaluate like that branding and culture. And with what happened with PPP last year, so the government had a program for small businesses that the PPP program covered your payroll expenses. It was free money as long as, um, so the Small Business Administration came to the banks and they said, you know, build a program inside of your bank and cover payroll in your communities, in your markets, take the application. And as long as they use it for payroll, um, we, the government, the SBA will give them the money and it's free. So a lot of banks, a lot of banks offered PPP loans, small business administration, but um, not all of them had the infrastructure to make money off of them. Now, some banks did really well. Others, it was an expense to the bank, the way that it was managed. So we do expect there to be a lot of merger and acquisition of the small banks over the next couple of years is the banks who did PPP well made a lot of money. Um, and that gave them capital and leverage to go out and buy smaller banks. So we actually, my CEO, Rory Retrieve, was highlighted on the Pittsburgh Business Times and did an interview two weeks ago on how we're going to move into the Pittsburgh market. And we are in the Pittsburgh banking market. And there are two ways to get into banking. You either build, start from scratch, start at zero, bring in a customer base. That's called, um, that's, that's called organic growth and then through mergers and acquisitions. So if there's another uh, a bank close by that maybe isn't as strong or a small community bank um, that, w- that would wanna f- join forces with us, banks, we've raised capital to do that as well. And then we just buy that bank and take on their branches. Which is basically what happened in this area when United yes. Bank came in. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, because I'm really interested now, and I have a job. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me. It really is. What do you recommend for someone that might be interested in banking? I see your thumb. 
<laughs> so I'm sorry. I, I know I had to plug my phone in. Sorry. No problem. But have you? Uh, do you recommend for someone that may be interested in banking to start looking into doing a teller's job? Because you are going to get trained by the bank, correct? You are. So I I say that I had the best boot camp ever. You will get trained by the bank. They will teach you to do exactly what you need to do. They will teach you about the a the regulations and the regulations are different depending on what size bank you are. So when you start as a teller, well, to to get into the role, you usually take like a basic aptitude test. Like, can you count? Do you um, like situational? Like if somebody came up to your window and said ABC, how would you respond? So they at least know like a baseline of what you need to know. Um, But the bank will teach you everything. I was a psychology major to begin with, my original major. So I happened to be in a night class with a regional manager from PNC at the time. And she well, it was National City at the time. And she said, hey, we have this part-time teller job available. Um, why don't you come and work at the bank part-time? Okay. So, so the bank will teach you everything that you need to know. And if you want to continue your career in banking, they could also offer you tuition reimbursement to do that. Well, Tiffany, thank you very much. As you heard the bell rang, I really appreciate it. I could probably have you back in three or four times to keep talking about this. My gosh, I I could just talk for days. For days. (laughs) It is it is very very interesting. And actually, your husband works with one of my former students, Richie Grioli, who Yes. yes. When I found out that he works there, we were refinancing our bank loan, which was really awkward that I sit down and my former student is handing me paperwork to sign. I know. So it, it is it just one of those situations. But no, thank you very much. I, I, my pleasure. Really, and if they have 